It's great to be here for our second day at MPW Next Gen. We'll keep the momentum going today with an outstanding lineup of speakers and plenty of opportunities for networking. And I hope everybody enjoyed the breakfast. I went to Women Funding Women and it was outstanding. Some of you, but first, some of you may be familiar with the broadsheet, which is our very popular newsletter that gives you a daily dose of the news on the world's most powerful women. In keeping with Fortune's commitment to journalism around women in business, all of you will be receiving a complimentary subscription in your inbox tomorrow morning, so please enjoy. Round of applause for the broadsheet. Is Kristen here? Where's Kristen? Can she stand? I don't think she, maybe she's not here. She was just moderating. Okay. Anyway, Kristen and Claire and Emma do a fabulous job on the broadsheet and we love them for it. Um, and we'd once again like to take the opportunity to thank our event partners, Accenture, Bank of America, Elementum, Herman Miller, Johnson & Johnson, and Salesforce. Please, let's give them another round of applause. And now on to our first guest. As CEO of the Consumer Bank at J.P. Morgan Chase, our first guest this morning is leading the company's major retail expansion, which includes 400 new branches in major markets across the, com the country. She's a champion of the importance of diversity and the responsibility companies have in creating opportunities for minorities and underrepresented groups. Please welcome Tashonda Duckett. Welcome to Shunda. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Nice to you. you too. Uh, so, you are CEO of Chase Consumer Banking. Yeah. Tell us what that means and give us a sense of the kind of scope of your responsibility. Right. Well, first, it's so great to be here and to be at Fortune's Next Gen and not just be around women, but the diversity of the females here. <laughs> it is super dope. So. <laughs> Um, but in terms of being the CEO of the Consumer Bank, what that means is I'm responsible for over 50,000 employees. Uh, we have over 5,000 branches, 23 states. We're now expanding into markets like D.C. and Boston today. Um, and so 17,000 ATMs, a uh, very large bank delivering really great results, but always centered on doing the right thing for our clients. I'm a customer. Not Thank because of so this, much. I just am. Um, uh, and before that, you were CEO of Chase Auto Finance, but you've had a long career in finance. You started out at Fannie Mae, then uh, you made your way to JPM, JP Morgan in mortgage banking, and then auto finance. But what led you to pursue finance at the very beginning? What was the spark that led to that? Yeah, well, you know, there's always those moments of those unsung heroes. And for me, there was a family, Mr. and Ms. Patterson, and they told me about a program called Inroads. And so Inroads, which is a program for talented minorities that allows you to have exposure into corporate America, was my start. Had it not been for them, had it not been for a program like Inroads, I don't know if I would be the CEO of the Consumer Bank. And so it's so important to share information and then to give yourself the ability to take that risk. And so Inroads is my entree into corporate America. And was that when you were in college or? I was in college yeah. when I heard about Inroads and I interned at Fannie Mae and started my career at Fannie Mae and then in 2004 joined JP Morgan Chase. That's great. You, um, I want to talk a little bit about your background. You grew up in Addison, Texas. Arlington, Arlington Texas. Arlington, sorry. Yep. I've been to Arlington. It's okay. Um, and you talk a lot about Otis and Rosie Brown, your parents, yes. and the impact they had on you and how they shaped who you are. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, they are my heroes. So to give you the quick version, uh, my dad is from Louisiana, did not go to college. Uh, he worked at Xerox as a stock handler, so basically in the warehouse. Um, my mom is an educator from Alabama. And so we moved from New Jersey. I was born in upstate New York, but at that time you could move with the company even if you were that blue collar worker. And so we moved from New Jersey to Texas with everything that we owned, two brothers and myself in a car, and we drove from New Jersey to Texas, which meant we started our life sitting on crates. Um, and then we started from the bottom. And when we got a little bit of furniture, we got robbed back on the crates. Um, but here's the point, the reason why I just adore my mom and dad, and they are my shiro and hero, is because they did a couple of things. My dad's from Louisiana. I'm first generation integration. His house was burned down twice by the Ku Klux Klan. My mother grew up in Alabama with a strong grandmother who raised her. But through all of their adversity, they taught us to reach for the moon. They taught us the importance of character. They taught us the importance of having empathy. And they taught us the importance of what you do, you do it with excellence. 
And so I know what it means to not have, but I know what it means to have a whole bunch of love and a whole bunch of confidence. And that's what my parents instilled in me. And so when I think about being a CEO, I think about Otis and I think about Rosie Brown um, and all that they have done and the sacrifices that they've made to just give me a shot. And that's why I talk so much about that. That's beautiful. <laughs> You have said that they were CEOs without having CEO titles. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Otis Brown. Just the name Otis Brown, y'all know, right? Yeah, I, I named a library after them in Arlington. Uh, it's in the living room. It's right by Texas Stadium. But to have Otis and Rosie Brown, my dad is probably the only portrait, because you know it's a professional look, where if you look closely, he has an earring in his ear. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's being your authentic self. <laughs> Absolutely. So you have said that you never really dreamed of be becoming oh, a no. top uh, corporate executive, and here you are, the CEO of this enormous business. You're also the first African American in this role at J.P. Morgan, and a very rare example of a female African American CEO in banking or in any large company. Yeah. Um, what is the significance of that to you? It's everything. You know, I think sometimes as women or people of color, we want to water down the journey. It is a big deal to be African American and to be a female in financial services and, the, and to be the CEO of Chase Consumer Bank. And so yes, I am, yeah. And, and so yes, I am super proud to simply be an executive, but I wanna be very intentional about recognizing that we're not where we want to be being black or being a female or someone of color. So it is with great pride that I say I am proud to be a female and I am proud to be African American and of course I am proud to be a CEO and to simply be an executive. But being a female and being African American is truly what has impacted my life and has shaped me in terms of who I am. And so I think I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And so I, I say it proudly and I'm super proud um, to really carry the torch. But I think success is not when you're the first. You only have the victory when you're the second, the third, and the fourth. So I'm not comfortable yet with this position. So let's talk about that. You, you, are, you speak a lot about this, about yeah. diversity and why we are still yeah. just nowhere near where we need to be. Um, why is that? I mean, you know, there is so much talk about it, but is there one thing that's not getting heard? Or is there, you know, what, what is the reason? And what can we do? Yeah. I mean, it sounds very simple, but I treat diversity and inclusion like you do any other effort in business. And we all are executives in our own right. And when you are not delivering the right level of returns or the right level of performance, you focus on it. And you do not allow excuses to get in the way. And so I think for diversity and inclusion, we just have to decide. We have to decide that it's important enough. We have to hold ourselves accountable. And I think it is about you are what you track and what you track gets done. You don't measure the outcome, you measure the drivers. Because if you're doing the drivers, then the outcome and the results will follow. But I think as a company and as an industry or just corporate it at large, I think one, we have to decide. Two, we have to hold people accountable. And when individuals say, I can't find, and if it's important enough, then that may mean I have to hire someone and major on folks who can, you know, and expand what I value. And I think lastly, we really have to make sure that it's not just the women's responsibility or the people of color's responsibility, because there's just not enough African Americans in corporate America to hold me accountable to the whole opportunity. We have to bring our men along. And we have to make sure that our men are part of this narrative. And we have to make sure that we bring them on the journey, not just in words, but with actions. Let them be the executive sponsor of a business resource group. Let them be the ones that go with you at an all-female event and have the ability to network and expand their horizon. My point is, we just have to say that it's important enough. It has to start from the top. And then you have to make sure you hold people accountable, just like you do every other business metric. Right. You and Melody Hobson have spoken about this. When a company doesn't meet earnings or has a, issues a product that fails with a consumer, you fix it. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's all about. You don't say, I just can't find the customer. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, in Texas, that dog don't hunt. You know, you <laughs> cannot do that. Um, and like Melody says, we have to stop admiring the problem. Right. You know, we have to stop talking about it. We have to be about it and focus on it. And the good news is, I think forums like this and I think forums across the country, I am hearing more and more intentionality 
about where we are and what we're going to do about it. So I am encouraged. And you mentioned men and starting yes. at the top. I mean, Jamie Dimon, the yes. CEO of JP Morgan, put this in his shareholder letter that yes. the company's focusing on hiring, retaining, and developing African American employees. The number of African American managing directors rose 17% last year. Did you have something to do with that? I would like to think so. Um, I think we all as leaders have something to do with the progress or the lack thereof. And so Jamie, I think, is just a phenomenal leader. Um, and he's really serious about understanding where we have not yet achieved excellence. And so yes, 50% of our operating committee is female, but only 30% overall are in leadership roles. And so though that may be better than most, it's not the level of standard that we would hold ourselves to to any other metric. And so for Jamie to put it in a shareholder's letter, for him to talk about it, not just during Women's History Month, um, for him to be bold about it and then hold us accountable, I think I have a hand in it, and I think the rest of the sisterhood at J.P. Morgan Chase does too, and so I'm incredibly proud about his boldness and accountability to saying there's more to be done and making sure that we're part of that change. We're going to go to questions in just a minute, um, but I want to ask you, you have four children. I do. Um, I, on the record, I ask male CEOs with four children this question also, because four is a lot of children. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you balance it off? No, how, do you, how do you kind of manage that with your huge career? Yeah. How has that been um, something that you've managed? <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Um, so I do no, it's have, wonderful, it's, to be it's, clear. It's amazing. It's life, right? But so it, it begs the question. Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. So I have four kids, 21 to 2. Um, okay, but get out your head. 21 is through marriage. I birthed the 12 and the 10, and I adopted my little cherry on top, who's now 2. Um, so having these kids is with a lot of intentionality in terms of how I want to define my life. Um, but I am fortunate enough to have a super amazing husband who is a Marine and an engineer, and he's now the stay-at-home dad. And I think, you know, for us, it's about never losing sight of what's important. And he was an entrepreneur, but we had to decide, living away from where our family network is, that someone needed to stay at home. And, you know, he understood that his job is to lighten my load. And for that, he decided to be the stay-at-home dad. What's his name? Richard. Yes. For Richard. Yes. Right. Shout out to Richard. Shout out to Richard. Yeah. Who has a question for Tashunda? Right here in the front row, we've got to wait for the Mike Candlers. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to point at the, at, at the yellow sign. Sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> You're fast. Please uh, identify yourself. Yes. Uh, Claire Tilke, Chief Operating Officer of Heinz Investment Management, Buildings Not Catch Up, and a fellow Texas-born girl. All right. Um, so many of us in this room are managing scaling businesses, and you have been such an incredible example of that. But managing culture is so hard when you're growing. And so I'm just curious to hear your tips or cautionary tales right. for setting business practice, but with culture yeah. as you're scaling really quickly. I think you start leadership with culture, and it ends with culture. And so for me, culture is what I double down on. I'm very clear about setting the mission and the vision for our business, connecting with our purpose. You know, our purpose is to help our clients make the most of their money so that they can make the most of their lives. And I say it everywhere I go. The other piece, I think, with culture is really making sure that as you scale, people are very clear on your values. And so being comfortable saying, this is who we are, this is who we're not. You know, culture is the worst behavior you're willing to tolerate. And so being clear about that. And so I think clarity is a beautiful thing. And with you as a leader, as you scale, when people know who you are, when they know what you stand for and what you value, and when they know their role in that journey, you will deliver the results and you will deliver at scale because they will know who their leader is and they'll know what success looks like. And it really starts and ends with culture. What's the ROC, the return on culture? And I think that's how you drive the results. ROC, yeah. great one. <laughs> Uh, another question. Anyone? Really? I've got a lot more. Okay. Oh, there is one. Okay. Yes, in the back. Hi, I'm Hi. Margaret Anadu. Uh, I work at Goldman. First, I just want to say I love you. <laughs> You're the best. Um, and actually, I don't have a question, just a comment. Yeah. I just wanted you to know when, when the announcement about your position came out, there were there, uh, three black women on my team, one of the most diverse teams at Goldman, which I'm proud of. Um, and the excitement that they had yeah. for you and your role was just was just tremendous. So I just wanted you to know. Obviously, it's an wow. amazing thing for all you know the sisterhood at, yep. at J.P. Morgan, but it goes just you know far Absolutely. beyond that. We're all so proud of you. Well, thank you so much. 
Yeah. I mean, whenever I hear that, I get goosebumps because um, when I was named CEO of the auto um, division, you know, to be you know, in my 30s and to be black and to be female leading the auto industry um, was a moment. And I got thousands of emails, including this one black man who sent me a note and said to Shonda, when I saw your picture, I wept because I have daughters and now I can show them what excellence looks like and what's possible. And so I do think it's important, um, again, to be comfortable talking about you know, your, who you are because there's just not enough of us. And I recognize that it expands well beyond J.P. Morgan Chase. It expands well beyond you know, just black women. It really is a sisterhood and a brotherhood of what's possible. And I think I represent that. That's great. Um, we have a couple questions over here. Hi. Hi, thank you for being here. My name's Windsor, I'm with Her Campus Media. And for college women in particular, yes. they're deciding what careers they wanna go into, yes. where should they go, other than being yourself, which is amazing, and being a role model, how do we get more young women to pursue roles in finance? Yeah. I mean, y'all know the song, it's all about the Benjamins, what, right? <laughs> so I think that women need to, um, really consider the power of finance. And what I would say to women in terms of the opportunity is anything that you're passionate about. If you one day wanna be an entrepreneur, it's great to understand the rules of the game and start inside so that you know how to manage, how to get to a series A round, you know, what's required. Um, I think that we all are CEOs of our household. And so what I think is so exciting about banking is we are in the life-making moment business. You know, whether you're looking to buy a home or start a small business or save for retirement or just save for a rainy day, we can do that. And banking, at least at J.P. Morgan Chase, is a technology company. It's a data company. It's a marketing company. And when you look at every aspect of our business, it's all massive. And so to come into a company like J.P. Morgan Chase and have the ability to just navigate your career in so many different areas, I think is amazing. For young women, I do want to say this. Finance is a serious, serious issue in our country. You know, one out of every three Americans have trouble with a real savings account, meaning enough to cover three to six months of their expenses. You know, over 40% of Americans would have trouble dealing with a life emergency. So this is not just about low income. This is about all people, and I do think that women we need the women who are the CEOs of their household to be more involved in the dialogue of money around credit and really understanding how to keep it 700 at plus and how to have that savings and that retirement fund. So I, I really think getting more women into banking will allow this conversation to be had in a much more comfortable and inviting way. So I'm open for business, send them my way. <laughs> we have a question here. Sure. Hi, Asahi Pompey, also Goldman Sachs. We love you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm sure you saw the nods in the room when you said, as the sisterhood, we tend to want to water down the journey. Yes. Can you expand upon that and any advice around how we fight that urge to water down the journey? I mean, when I walk in a room, you're going to see my race and you're going to see my gender. So, you know, it's like when you, if you go to a place of worship and you're walking out early and you do this, everybody sees you. <laughs> You know, you like walk like, I mean, they see you. And so for me, I'm like, this is me, you know? And I just think that we need to stop being apologetic and trying to fit in and saying, you know what? I just want to be equal. Yes, yes, I want to just be viewed as a CEO. But I think that part of my value, part of the ability to deliver the results in the way that I do it is because of who I am. And so I, I just think it's time out for watering it down. You know, be authentically you. And we talk about authenticity. Well, if we really want to be 100, then we should be OK saying that I'm female and I am proud to be a female. It doesn't mean that you should think of me less than because I am a woman. But it doesn't mean I have to let all of who I am at the door. And I think it's what makes us special. And I think it's you know, what allows us to do what we do. Um, and so I'm just proud. And, and I will talk about it and you know, share it and hope that I can inspire others to say, be OK being a woman and being OK joining forces with the sisterhood to make a real impact. 
Amen. Uh, and one final question over here. We don't have much yeah. time, so it'll have to be quick, unfortunately. Of course. Yeah. Um, my name's Adrian Penta. I run the Center for Women and Wealth at Brown yeah. Brothers Harriman, which is Great. the part of our private bank focused on women. And um, I love your message. I think it's, it's incredibly true. Women are driving these decisions around families and wealth and money and what they do with it. Um, but as we gain more success, both internally, because yeah. I think we are less apologetic than ever before, yeah. and in the marketplace, yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of, I think, um, you know, a lot of white men who are a little bit on their back heels yeah. who are thinking, oh, geez, it's not sure. my time. It's not the time for my son. And yep. how, do we, how do we be inclusive and cautious and thoughtful about yeah. that while being very much owning our own journey and not watering down yeah, the Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question, and we hear a lot about it. And I just start at the facts, you know. If you look at the number of black women or women in position, there's a lot of pie that's going on for everyone. Um, and so to me, you know, I think that ultimately we should all agree, including men, including white men, is that the world is better when we're all participating. And so it's not that I want to take his pie, I want to create my own slice. And I just want to make sure that I have an equal playing field to have access to it. And I think the reality is, is as we talk about the sisterhood or as we talk about the issues that we still have to face as women or people of color, you know, men, white men are hearing the narrative too. And for me, with my team, they're part of the tribe. They're not excluded. My white men will lead an African-American forum. They will lead a women's discussion because the reality is we cannot win without men, without white men, and we need them to lean in as well. And I think that it is about just talking about the, the opportunity that we all have and making sure that they understand it's not an or thing, it's an end thing. And so I know we have literally five seconds left, but let me just close by sharing this real tip to all of you as women. Um, live your life like a diversified portfolio. Clearly I'm in banking, so I have to make the, the diversified <laughs> portfolio analogy. But here's what I mean by that. Write down everything that matters to you. For me, it's a mother, it's a philanthropist, it's uh, an executive, it's a girlfriend. Write it all down, you can only allocate 100%. Here's the point. Just like your markets with your portfolio, you will have volatility. Sometimes you have to short the stock. But if you live your life like a diversified portfolio, over time, you'll outperform this thing called life. And you can have it all over time. And so I hope you all are living your life in a diversified way. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to message. all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.